Welcome back to Miss Kitchen Witch. I'm your host, Chris, and today we're gonna to be talking about the autumnal equinox, our official first day of fall. It's a harvest festival, and for many pagans, it is the festival of Thanksgiving, Mabon. Now, that name was actually taken from a character in Welsh literature, assigned to the holiday by Adrian Kelly, a Wiccan in the 1970s. However, people have been celebrating the autumnal equinox for as long as there's been an autumnal equinox and people to celebrate it. A lot of the activities are very similar to Thanksgiving. It's about not only bringing in the harvest, but being thankful for what we have and the plenty of this time of year. You may have noticed that a lot of these festivals coincide with harvests, and that's no surprise considering how much our ancient ancestors depended on that food. We used to live in close companionship with the earth and knew her ins and outs. And really, that's what these holidays are designed to do, to cause us to reflect, look back, and feel our connection to the earth beneath our feet. No harvest stays fresh forever, so ancient peoples found a number of ways to keep things preserved. Most common of these was actually salt curing. We're gonna actually use a little bit of salt curing today, but we're going to take advantage of the naturally occurring bacteria in cabbage. We're going to have a lacto-fermentation, which will preserve the cabbage in a way that we can keep it indefinitely, if it's, even if it's unrefrigerated. Have you guessed what it is yet? Cabbage, salt, those are the only two ingredients. You can add caraway if you want. We're making sauerkraut. Now, I know, you've had sauerkraut on a hot dog, it's gross. And to be honest, I spent my whole life hating sauerkraut until I learned to make it myself. A friend of mine taught me how, and it's completely changed how I view it. Not only is it delicious, but I end up throwing it on salads and in lots of different applications. It has beneficial bacteria for gut health, it tastes great, and it keeps the cabbage forever. I've had a jar in my fridge that I made three months ago, and it's still as though I made it yesterday. According to Roman mythology, cabbages sprung from the tears of Lysurgis, who was a great king Maybe that's why cabbages and salt go so well together, because they're made of the tears of a king. Now, we're going to cut up this whole cabbage and put it aside in this bowl. When you're doing this, you're just gonna cut it in half and then you're gonna to wanna to cut the stem out of the cabbage. But remember, don't throw it away because that's a perfect item for your stock bag in the fridge. Now, be super careful because it is a little tough and you don't wanna hurt yourself. But more importantly, you don't wanna hurt the cabbage. You know, ancient Romans were totally nuts about cabbages. In fact, Egyptians would often swear oaths by, by an onion, like you would say, I swear on my mother's grave. Egyptians would be like, I swear on an onion. Romans would say, I swear on a cabbage. Greeks and Romans thought that cabbages had extraordinary healing powers. They said that throat ailments could be cured by wrapping them in cabbages. Egyptian pharaohs, would often eat large quantities of cabbages, of cabbages the night before they planned to get really drunk because they thought the cabbage would keep them from getting hung over. There are scrolls from as far back as 1000 AD that were found in China that recommend cabbage as a cure for baldness. It's funny, right? Remember before we we're talking about sympathetic magic? Does this look like a bald head to you? Maybe? Now, if you are growing your own cabbage, you can actually harvest the whole thing and then leave the root in the ground and it'll grow greens for salad. But if you're in Sussex and Kent, you need to make a deep X into the actual stem of the cabbage because that keeps mischievous sprites away from it. And demons. I don't know why mischievous sprites or demons would want to go near cabbage, but once you've had the sauerkraut, you'll understand why. You know, this sauerkraut is beloved by Captain Cook. That's right, the pirate. You're probably not gonna believe me, but this is true. He had his ship's doctors apply sauerkraut to the wounds of his crew members. 
And before you tell me that that's crazy and it wouldn't do anything beneficial, they found that the wounds treated by sauerkraut were way less likely to have gangrene. I think probably it was a combination of the saltiness and the fact that the bacteria, the lactobacteria kill the bad bacteria. Plus, if we're being honest, the sauerkraut was probably the cleanest thing on Captain Cook's ship. Listen, I know that cabbage has traditionally been the food of the poor, but between the different health benefits and how sustainable it is, just don't be a vegetable snob, I guess, because you're really missing out. We've cut up half our head of cabbage. It is, I think that's more than enough for what we're gonna do today. So I'm just gonna put this aside. So what we've got here is about three pounds of cabbage. Most recipes would say that you should probably add a tablespoon and a half of kosher salt to this afterwards. But I really have always played it by ear. The person who taught me how to make sauerkraut told me that it should be, quote, as salty as a potato chip. So I kind of go with that as my guide. Um, we're going to add this slowly. And it's kind of an amazing process to watch because really, you're not doing much. You're just salting the cabbage and kind of turning it. I should probably, you know what? So we're going to salt this a little bit more. Now, here's a little trick for making sure you're getting salt on all your parts of the cabbage. If you put one bowl over the other one, you can give it a good shake and really get that cabbage properly covered. One of the most important things you want to do is to keep this sterile. So the jar that it's going to go into, the bowls that you're working with, if they can have, you know, be as clean as possible and also really make sure your hands are clean before you start. Okay, that's kind of where we want to be. Salty is a potato chip. It's covering each piece well. And the process is beginning. If we look close at this bowl, you'll see that the cabbage is slowly starting to release its water. We're gonna let this sit for just a little while so that the salt can start to draw the moisture out of the cabbage. Everyone has their own twist on sauerkraut after they start making it for a while. But the thing that I've really come to love is adding ginger. I know it sounds a little weird, but the freshness of the ginger, it's killer. It really makes the sauerkraut 10 times of what it could have been. Um, when I clean ginger, like when I peel it, I don't use a vegetable peeler. I feel like it, you lose a lot of the ginger. So I actually use a teaspoon and I just run the teaspoon over the ginger and it just cleans off, whoops, cleans off all the skin. So I just run the spoon over the ginger and it really just pulls the skin right off. I guess if you wanted to, you could put the ginger in in big pieces with the skin on, but I like to just like munch on the big pieces of pickled ginger as well. So I'm gonna really give it a good peel. Um, and then I'm just gonna thinly slice this ginger. So as you can see, the cabbage has shrunk a little in size just in the five minutes that it's been salted and some of the water's been released into the bottom of the bowl. We're gonna continue this process, but we're gonna load it into a clean place where it can ferment and so the lactobacteria can play. A fermentation station, if you will. We added a little ginger, but I think that caraway is also a lovely thing to add. So we're just going to throw that in now. I don't know, maybe like a tablespoon or two, it's sort of up to your judgment. Because we've added a new ingredient, we're gonna give our cabbage one last shake. We're gonna be 
kind of a little less so. We're gonna keep it upright this time just because so much water has been released. We don't wanna pour cabbage water all over the counter. All right, there we go. I just washed and cleaned out this swing top jar. Um, and we are going to put our cabbage in here. So basically what I'm gonna do, just so you can kind of watch this process, is I'm gonna load it into this jar and then we're gonna set it aside on our fermentation station and we're gonna work on our next project and sort of let this sit for a while because I think it's hard to imagine how much water comes out of this cabbage until you've seen it for yourself. So now things are starting to get tight. Um, I have a jam jar that fits perfectly into the mouth of this big jar. We can use that. We're not only gonna use that to press the cabbage down, but eventually we'll use it to weight the sauerkraut under the water line. See, eventually, and I know again that you, this seems crazy right now, the enough water will come out of the cabbage that it will fill most of this jar and cover the cabbage that's inside. What we wanna do is while the sauerkraut is fermenting, we wanna keep the line of the cabbage under the line of that water. It's gonna make sure that mold doesn't grow on our cabbage. So you don't want any leaves breaking the tension of the water, essentially. I'm gonna press this down again. So now you can see that the water line is slowly moving up the jar. We can see where the water is accumulating here at the bottom, and eventually that'll continue to rise as the cabbage continues to fall. We really want to make sure that no dust or anything gets into this. Um, and I'm not quite ready to tie something on top. So for now, we're just going to put this dish towel over it. I know you were sort of hoping that I'd do a magic trick, but um, right now I'm just keeping dust out of sauerkraut. Like I said, the autumn equinox is sort of a witch's Thanksgiving. We're celebrating the harvest and the bounty and trying to be thankful for the things that we have. My family memories of this time of year always include pumpkin pie. And it's no wonder that many witches suggest buying pumpkin pie spice if you want to do a money or a bounty spell. Why is that? Because cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, they all relate to bounty, prosperity, money, and protection. But bounty isn't just about money. It's about having a full life with friends, love, and all of the things that you deserve. So now we're gonna make the perfect pie crust. And I really only need the base of the pumpkin pie today, so I'm gonna half my recipe. That means one stick of grated butter and one cup and one quarter of flour. The grating of the butter works awesome, but it's pretty warm. We're cooking this harvest fall meal in July here in Brooklyn, and it is warm. So after I shred a little bit of the butter. I'm just gonna throw a little bit of the flour on top. That way the pieces of butter don't stick together or stick together less. Because really that's what you're doing. You want these little bursts of butter integrated into the flour. Those little pieces of butter are what create the different layers and flakes in the crust. We're also um, adding a little extra sugar this time. So with the cup and a quarter of flour. We also have half a teaspoon of salt and then two teaspoons of sugar. Cold butter and cold water are essential for making a good pie crust. My water is in my freezer right now so that it gets extra chilly. And then we're going to Combine that flour in with the butter. So I'm gonna toss that together a little bit. And I really don't need to mess with it too much 
because we have that butter so nicely shaved. So this time we're gonna use between a quarter to an eighth of a cup of ice cold water. But then it really starts to come together. So now it's beautiful. I can see all of the pieces of butter integrated with the flour. We're at the perfect stage to let it rest. We're gonna put it in the fridge for about an hour to let it rest and to let the gluten develop just a little bit. And then we'll be ready to make some kick-ass pumpkin pie. Okay, so our pie crust is cooling and we have our oven at 425 heating up and getting ready. I have all of our ingredients for the pumpkin pie filling here, but I think it's time to take a little trip to fermentation station and see what's going on. So last time we saw this, the jar was just starting to show some water. And oh wow, we've got a lot more now and we can definitely see that Ah, oh, this is starting to sink um, and the water is rising. We're still not at the point where I'm happy with the level of water we're getting out of this cabbage, but I do want to start weighting it down a little. That's going to help a lot. So to aid us in this process, I have a bag of marbles. We have our second jelly jar in here, providing pressure onto the cabbage. And we're just gonna give it a little extra weight by pouring these marbles into the glass. All right, now I want to apply just a little pressure here, so, um, all right, nope, we're not quite at the point where I can swing this jar shut. But the extra weight should help us. And we're just gonna continue to keep an eye on this. Let's talk pumpkin. In this bowl, I have 15 ounces of pureed pumpkin. Um, it is the pumpkin from the Canada supermarket. I know a lot of people are saying, but fresh in season. And 99.9 .9 times, I totally agree. But if you've ever made a pumpkin pie from scratch directly from fresh pumpkin, it's just not as good. Um, the canned pumpkin has had a lot of the water removed. It's really uniform in texture and in like, the way it feels in your mouth. Um, so it actually works a lot better for pumpkin pie filling than trying to stew your own from scratch. If you wanna do it, more power to you. I've just done both and for me, it's not worth the time and trouble and effort. So we talked a little bit about the pumpkin pie spices. Um, I am got some cloves in here. Um, if you have a spice grinder, which you should have separate from your coffee grinder. Don't grind spices in your coffee grinder. You can use that, but we're old school here. So I'm gonna use my pestle and mortar. Most pumpkin pie recipes call for a half a teaspoon of clove, a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, and a half a teaspoon of nutmeg. I like to do a little more than that, and I'm also gonna be adding some ground dried ginger today. When you're grinding spices with a pestle and mortar, you wanna do some heavy hitting for sure, but then also press and rub the spices around the bottom against the stone. That's gonna really help you get a fine grain. Nobody wants a big chunk of clove in their mouth when they're having this pumpkin pie. So if you're gonna do it the rustic way, make sure that you're being very efficient and you're having a good attention to detail. So we also need to add three eggs, which we're gonna beat, um, and those will go into the filling. Uh, we are going to put the cloves and we have some fresh cinnamon here that I'm gonna grate. Ooh, our oven's ready. I'm also going to add half of a nutmeg. Then we're gonna add the sugar. <laughs> it's a cup of sugar. I'm gonna mix some of the sugar and the pumpkin pie together before we add the egg. So 
If you want the pumpkin pie to be super bright orange, you can certainly use white sugar. Um, the brown sugar does make the pumpkin pie dark, but I vastly prefer the flavor of dark sugar as opposed to white sugar, so. So let's integrate the three eggs. If you have a stand mixer, this is a great time to bust it out. Okay, it looks like our pumpkin pie filling is about ready. I am gonna be using my metal rolling pin for this. You can see the steam coming off of it because when I'm making pastry, I keep my metal rolling pin in the freezer. You can actually do that with a wooden rolling pin too. It's really just about getting the rolling pin nice and cold. This pie crust has been resting and chilling, which are like two of my favorite activities. So I'm actually gonna bake this pie right in a cast iron pan, but first I have to roll out the dough. We're just going to lightly dust our countertop with flour and lightly dust our rolling pin with flour. You know, bakers get awfully attached to the kind of brand of flour they like. I know a lot of King Arthur devotees or people that only get their flour from one kind of miller. As you are rolling out the pastry dough, you're gonna find that it sort of cracks at the edges. You can sort of build it back up just a little bit and then roll it out again. I'm sure there's like some pastry chef somewhere who's gonna leave some angry comment about how that's not the right way, but um, like I didn't go to the Cordon Bleu and I also like don't care. No, just kidding, I do care. Please tell me all the information. This is really tough um, because if I'm being frank, it is about 95 degrees, the absolute opposite of what is ideal for pastry crust. But we are going to do our best. Um, actually, I hate that. I kind of want to re-roll it out. So I have to literally put this back in the fridge. It's not, it's literally just melting. It's falling apart. I think it's just, I think it's just too hot in here. I have to drop the temperature. It's super hot, about 90 degrees or so in here, so I'm trying to work as quickly as possible. If you're forced to do a little patchwork action, which you might be, um, a little bit of water can go a long way, but very little bit of water. Um, when things are imperfect or a little bit off, we just call them rustic and call it a day. We're just going to add the pie filling and try to smooth it out as best we can. So this is going to go into the oven at 425 for about 40 to 45 minutes. Oh yeah, hot pie. Here it comes. All right, so let's talk about this pumpkin pie. This pumpkin pie tells me many things. That's right, it's for divination. No, actually, it tells me that one side of my oven is quite a bit hotter than the other side, and I probably should have turned the pie around halfway through. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's funny, actually, the crack that appeared in this pie looks a little bit like a five-pointed star, which couldn't be more appropriate for a kitchen witch. Next time I'll know to rotate my pie halfway through and maybe pull almost 10 minutes off the cook time. And now we're gonna take one more trip to fermentation station. The water level has really risen with our cabbage. Um, this little thing of marbles is working well, doing its job. Um, we're gonna let this sit out um, probably for another three to 10 days, depending on 
how like fermented you really want it to be. If you see any sign of mold that's black, white, or green growth, um, if it's black, you need to throw the whole thing away. You got, it's just not healthy. I will put a piece of fabric on the top um, and probably put a rubber band around it to secure it. That'll keep dust out, but still will allow some airflow. Um, you could also close the sauerkraut and burp it once a day, but I, which means to burp it means to open, to release some of the gases. Um, but I really have had much better luck with the cloth cover method. Now, after three to 10 days, when it's to the consistency that you like it, I would then move it into the refrigerator. That stops the fermentation and, um, and makes it last for a very long time. Now, I have a jar of sauerkraut in my fridge that I made about three months ago, so I'm gonna pop that out so you can take a look and see what it looks like. Okay, so this is a jar of sauerkraut that I made about three months ago. It, as you can see, it no longer looks bright green. It's all sort of washed out to a white color. I didn't add caraway seeds to this batch. This is just cabbage, salt, and ginger. Um, but even three months on, and you'll be able to hear this on my lav. I'm trying to get like a nice piece. Not the wet, gross sauerkraut from the hot dog stand at all. That is a delicious addition to eggs in the morning, to salads. It has a really nice pickly quality. And the ginger, a little burst of brightness that really makes the whole dish. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Fall Equinox episode of Ms. Kitchen Witch. I hope we've given you some new ideas and maybe, just maybe, you'll give cabbages a second chance. Maybe you'll even find that you swear oaths on them like the Romans did. Either way, I hope sometime you swear an oath to come back and watch another episode of Ms. Kitchen Witch. Hello, it's me. You know, yesterday I pulled the pie out of the oven and it wasn't what I wanted it to be and I said a lot of things about accepting things as they are and being okay when something goes wrong and it was lies and mendacity. It was hipster bullshit. I, <laughs> I was really disappointed and even though I know that this pie is gonna taste fine, I was really frustrated because we are shooting this episode in the middle of summer and we're in a Brooklyn apartment where air conditioning is only on the outside and it's 90 degrees out and we have to turn the AC off usually for sound. And if you have ever tried to make pastry in the middle of summer, you know that it literally is melting through your hands while you're trying to do it. Because pastry crust is something I've done a lot more of. It was super frustrating for it to turn out so much, so far away from what I wanted it to be. Um, so last night after my director went home, I went back into my fridge and I remade the pie, sort of. I didn't really have enough leftover filling to make another whole pie, so I ended up making four mini pies. Um, and here is my takeaway. One, if you are making pumpkin pie, the timing of the recipe is so important that I would never actually go by the exact time that it says on whatever recipe you have. Your oven is gonna be a little bit different, so maybe after 15, 20 minutes, like keep an eye on it. You want the middle to be just still jiggling a little bit, almost set. Um, don't want it to be super cooked all the way through. I didn't actually have enough filling to make a whole nother pie. So what I decided to do was shrink it down and do a mini version. Um, I used a muffin tin and I used a large like camping mug to cut out perfect circles and then I could just drop those into the muffin tin, which made a tiny pie crust. I actually do this a lot. Um, I like to make small mini pies for parties just because it's easier for people to just grab and go. And like you can hold it while you're drinking, which is very important at a cocktail party. With cooking, it's not the end of the world. If something goes a little awry, you can always try again. Um, and I did, and I'm actually really happy with the results. Um, and I have taken away some important pumpkin pie lessons and reminders. So I was able to put those together, remake the filling, time it out a lot better. I also um, went as far as using some of the extra dough to make 
some leaves and I did some braiding on the edge of these um, just to like make it a little, I don't know, I really felt like I had to go for it hard because this turned out so far away from the way that I wanted it. Like I did want it to be big and beautiful and rustic, but like all of those things just like <laughs> went so far afield that I decided to go totally in the opposite direction and make these tiny little delicate things. Um, I also used a egg wash on the edge like I wanted to do for the galette and forgot. Um, so I feel like this is the redemption arc here. My character arc right back here where I, I give it another go. Um, and it's always worth another go. There's gonna be disasters. We're dealing with new situations all the time. Um, but as long as you, whatever. Uh, it's, I don't know why this mattered so much to me. I just, I think I just didn't want, I didn't want the pie to f***ing win. Too many todays, none of tomorrows. And now I'm gonna show you how, you lucky sons of bitches. Sorry, do I have cabbage in my hair? For me, one of the things that crosses between the mundane and the fantastic, well, that's far too grandiose for what I'm about to say. Oh wait, sorry. It's like so hot, I'm like losing my mind. <sighs> you won with your pie. Love your pie. I love your pie's imperfections as you love the imperfections in yourself. I don't know, I'm not a philosopher. I'm just a woman with a kitchen. Wanna get anything else? Oh. Yeah, I wanna get me throwing this pie off the roof. All right. Cut. <laughs> 